When the Capitol building was built, the first floor was designed to house various executive departments. Behind me here is the suite of offices that was used for the Superintendent of Public Instruction. 21 superintendents of public instruction used these spaces until the office moved to another building. One of those men was Henry Romine Pattengill. Henry Pattengill was born in Mount Vision, New York on January 4, 1852 and moved to Michigan with his family in 1865. At a young age, Pattengill was injured in a farming accident, causing him to remain bedridden for months and leading him to walk with a limp for the rest of his life. Due to his injury, he was unable to pursue his dream of being a sailor, so he turned his attention to more academic pursuits. He attended the University of Michigan and graduated with a literary degree in 1874. He decided to pursue a career in education and was appointed superintendent of schools in St. Louis, Michigan. He served there for two years before being hired as a superintendent of schools in Ithaca, Michigan. While he was there, Pattengill advocated for the building of a new high school. The new school had a bell tower and Pattengill personally gave 10 lectures to raise money for the bell. The bell, when cast, was inscribed with a poem penned by Pattengill. With cheerful sound to grash at youth, I ring for learning right and truth. Let all who hear my merry chime beware the ills of misspent time. During his time in Ithaca, Pattengill also got involved in local politics. In 1881, he was elected president of the village of Ithaca and was re-elected in 1882. He also acted as president of the Gratiot County Teachers Association, was on the county board of examiners and the board of school inspectors. In 1884, Pattengill became an editor for the Michigan School Moderator, a semi-monthly educational magazine for teachers and school boards. In 1885, he purchased the magazine. One year later, he moved to Lansing and, in addition to running the magazine, was hired an assistant professor of English at Michigan Agricultural College, now Michigan State University. In 1892, Henry Pattengill was elected superintendent of public instruction. Today, the superintendent of public instruction is an appointed position, but at that point in time, it was still an elected position. He was re-elected in 1894 and served until 1896. Pattengill was known for his support of rural schools based on a township model. He advocated for compulsory attendance, free textbooks, the establishment of school libraries, and promoted teaching of history and current events. He also strove to increase professionalism of teaching in the state. He strengthened requirements for teachers' education and certification. As superintendent of public instruction, Pattengill was responsible for writing teacher examination questions that were administered by county officials who were responsible for certifying teachers. He encouraged county examiners to approve candidates based solely on merit and not on special favors, saying, the work of the teacher is far too a sacred thing to be farmed out to favorites. Good enough is a dangerous motto for a school board to adopt in the employment of a teacher. There is enough flexibility provided in the power which the county examining boards hold to prevent a dearth of teachers, but it is ardently hoped that such boards have stamina enough to protect the school from lazy incompetence or listless camp followers. Pattengill also put forward tremendous effort to help improve teacher training. As superintendent of public instruction, he took over a system of teacher training institutes that were offered throughout the state. These institutes provided lectures on various topics related to teaching different subjects. He also began a series called Inspirational Institutes, which were shorter weekend programs to instruct teachers with different schedules. Pattengill was also the first superintendent of public instruction to visit every Michigan county. He traveled extensively around the state, visiting schools and colleges, and speaking at the various institutes. In his report to the legislator filed in 1895, Pattengill reported traveling 34,826 miles visiting 854 schools and colleges, and speaking in 213 locations around the state in the previous year. Pattengill's speaking engagements did not end with his time as superintendent of public instruction. He spent the rest of his career traveling the lecture circuit. In one biographical sketch published in 1915, Pattengill was described as being active and prominent in institute work in the lecture field, where he is probably the best known man in Michigan. The article goes on to state that he has lectured in nearly 500 towns, cities, and villages in 15 states, making many return dates in some of them. In addition to his work in education and policy, Pattengill was also an author. He wrote and compiled a number of books for students and teachers. One of the most popular was Civil Government of Michigan, which was used as a classroom text and saw over 20 editions published. Pattengill's Manual of Orthography was published for teachers and students to use to learn spelling, diction, and pronunciation. Pattengill also compiled books of quotes and sayings for use in the classroom and in life. 
Titles included Thoughts for Those Who Think, Tip Top Pieces for Little Folks, and Hints from Squints. A firm believer that one of the best ways to teach a child was through song, Pattengill also compiled songbooks for use in the classroom. These he titled School Song Knapsack and Pat's Pick, a collection of the sweetest, sanest, jolliest folk school and patriotic songs. In the introduction to Pat's Pick, he explained this philosophy. Music is a potent factor in school government. You can sing into youth what you cannot preach into them. Sweet, wholesome, joyous songs are a prime factor in character building. Unfortunate indeed is the school where singing is omitted. Intended to be used in schools, the books could be purchased individually, by the dozen, or in sets of 100, and contained an assortment of songs for all occasions. In addition to his lecturing and publishing career, after his time as superintendent of public instruction, Pattengill remained active in politics and served on many state boards. He was a member of the State Board of Library Commissioners, the State Board of Geographical Survey, the State Board overseeing the State Normal School, which would become Eastern Michigan University, the State Board of Education, the Board of the Michigan Historical Society, and served as secretary of the Pioneer Society. In 1914, Pattengill ran for governor on the National Progressive Ticket, also known as the Bull Moose Party, but came in third. He was beaten by former Republican Governor Chase Osborne and the incumbent Democratic Governor Woodbridge Ferris. Ferris won the overall race, but had Pattengill's 36,747 votes gone to Osborne, Osborne would have won another term. Pattengill declined to run for governor again in 1916, but still received 95 votes from men who wrote his name in as a candidate. In Lansing, Pattengill was active with the Rotary Club, the YMCA, the Lansing Grange, and with First Baptist Church. He helped to promote the Open Forum and the Christian Forum in Lansing. This movement promoted educational lectures and discussion. Henry Romine Pattengill died on November 26, 1918, following a brief illness and was buried in Mount Hope Cemetery in Lansing. In the decade after his death, schools in Detroit and Lansing were named in honor of him. Pattengill was also honored with a monument created by former students. When Pattengill left Ithaca schools, he left behind a group of students who admired him so much that they created a Pattengill reunion organization that met annually for over 30 years. At their 31st annual meeting, the group decided to create a monument to Pattengill and form the Pattengill Memorial Association. This monument took the form of a tower made of individual stones contributed by former pupils and contained stones from 20 states, 25 Michigan counties, and one stone from South America. Each of these stones had a story attached, copper ore mined in the Upper Peninsula, a stone from the shores of Lake Ontario, a chip of marble from the construction of the Lincoln Memorial. The monument was erected in 1925 in Ithaca, and in 2014, a historical marker was placed beside it, honoring the life and career of one of Michigan's most well-known educators.